Hello everyone. I want to talk today about what's going on in Iran right now. The brutality of the Islamic Republic and the Mullahs is absolutely out of control. I wanted to talk about what's going on, not in a detailed sense. Instead, I wanted to talk more on a kind of strategic level. The first thing to understand is these kind of totalitarian authoritarian regimes they might appear very strong, and as they say, the crackdown has been very brutal, but they're incredibly fearful. They appear strong, but they're actually riddled with all kinds of weaknesses. And their weakness is the fear that they have. They have all of the, the money. They've monopolized the wealth of your country. They've monopolized the, the weaponry, the, the military, etc. But you have the numbers. And if you gather together, if you concentrate those numbers, if you create a nationwide movement, that that terrifies them. They live every day with the insecurity knowing that the numbers could completely destroy them and they have a lot to lose. So while you might appear to be the weaker side because you don't have the money and you don't have the weaponry on your side, you are in essence the stronger side if you realize this basic fact of strategy, that they are terrified of movements like yours. This is for every kind of totalitarian, authoritarian regime in the world. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. You are the stronger side in this struggle. So in my study of, of these things, there are two things that authoritarian dictatorships survive by their main strategy. And I would summarize it with two words, separation and silence. And those two things, separation and silence, actually go hand in hand. You can't do one without the other. And what I mean by this is, since you have the stronger hand in this through the numbers, the numbers of people, literally, quantity, their main strategy is to keep you continually separated. If you join together in any form, in any kind of public way, through demonstrations, through unions, whatever, that gives you power. So their whole game is to keep you continually separated. And I could, I could compare it to some kind of machine that is continually to kind of grinding things down and separating them to small and smaller and smaller pieces. They want you to be spending most of your time at home, worrying about how to get by with money and, and concerned about your own private life, as opposed to thinking about the country as a whole. They want to separate you in various ways. They want to pit men versus women. They want to pit Persians versus Kurds. They want to pit upper classes versus middle classes. They want to pit whatever it is they can, so that by dividing you, the old strategy of divide and conquer, that strength that you have in numbers is greatly diluted, and they, they can have the upper hand. So they're trying to continually crush and pressure you into spending most of your time outside the public realm. They may try to bribe you, like, well, spend your time, you can do your time shopping, you can go to malls, you can go to movies. But anything that involves the public, where it's not on the where, where people can express their dissatisfaction, that is forbidden. So they have slowly tried to erode these kinds of regimes. Try to slowly erode any kind of public space, any kind of gathering spot for people in in the square, any kind of political rally, and also unions. They're trying to get rid of any kind of unions. This goes hand in hand with the other strategy of silence. And the thing is, in these kinds of situations, in countries that are suffering under these kinds of regimes, most people, the majority of people, are quite miserable. You have no power. You live in terror. You live in fear. But you don't get to express that. You, you, you don't, you're not mingling with other people. There's no outlet for it, except maybe on social media, which they greatly control, and there's lots of censorship. They control the media, the mainstream media, as, as it were. So they envelop you in this kind of silence, where everybody is unhappy, or most people in Iran or in these countries, 90%, 95% are deeply unhappy about it, but there's no way to understand that everybody else feels the same way. I like to call that a public secret. It's shared by everybody in the public, but it's a secret that nobody gets to talk about or express. So they're trying to continually silence you by controlling the internet, by controlling social media, by getting rid of all kinds of spaces where you can congregate and express 
and understand that most people in the country feel the same way. The main response on your side is to overcome this separation, to show that this idea that you are separated is an illusion, that this idea that you're not unhappy, that you're not miserable is an illusion. You want to break this kind of spell that they have created over you where you're all separated, you're all living in your private homes, you're all living in your little neighborhoods and nobody's communicating with one another. So you want like a nationwide movement. You want to open the doors so that everybody is seen together, visibly seen together. The more numbers, the better. And you want to try and resist this kind of dynamic that they're foisting upon you of continual separation. So what is happening in these movements, and we've seen it in Sri Lanka, we've seen it in Russia, we've seen it in other parts of the world, in, in the Arab Spring movement, where there is this beginning of this, of this swelling movement among the populace that's growing, is that they're going to continually try to pit one side against another. They want to kind of fracture your movement. They want to make it seem that you are actually going to create more problems, that businesses are going to fail, that you're going to make life worse for people in this country. So they're going to try and separate the working classes from the elites, et cetera, et cetera, or men versus women, because this is a movement that largely at first was generated by women with the uh, Amini protests, which is one of the most important factors in your favor, actually, because the thing is, if you get women involved in a movement like this, it's women from all classes, women from all ethnicities. This bridges all of the separation um, gaps that they're trying to create. You're overcoming the separating tendency that they're bringing through actually the, the organizing of women of all classes and ethnicities throughout the country. But they're going to try and separate you, and you have to resist this with all of your might. So you're all in this together. Every person, every ethnicity, every faction is in this together. And you're not going to fall for the dynamic where they're going to try and separate you on any level. The other thing is the silence. You have to be continually voicing your, your and, and making it apparent and making it clear so that this public secret becomes public knowledge. Everybody in the country knows what is going on. Everybody knows that everybody else, their neighbors, are equally unhappy. Everyone has the same similar kind of complaints and gripes and is suffering in the same way. And your voices are raised and you're raising it continually. You're shouting from your balconies. You're shouting from the rooftops. You're, you're giving slogans out. You're breaking the spell of silence that they're trying to foist on you on a day-to-day-to-day -day -day basis. Now, the thing I've come to learn in, in studying these movements is the element of time, which is an incredibly important factor. Because what often happens is there's this initial burst, this initial wave of anger. It kind of overcomes everything I've talked about. It overcomes the separating dynamic. It overcomes the silence. And then it tends to fritter away because that's human nature. It's hard to sustain this very long, for very long. And so what will happen is, in the beginning, there'll be these moments where it kind of crystallizes these protests. And then there'll be these gaps of like a couple of weeks where nothing will happen. And then it kind of grows longer and longer and longer. And the whole thing kind of peters out. And then the crackdown is even, the situation becomes even worse because they have learned from your protest movement how to fight more effectively against it, how to crush you even more brutally. And they're going to do it and they're going to find other ways. So it's a very dangerous moment. And what I've discovered is what I call is a wave theory of these kind of demonstrations. If you come at them with protests day after day after day, I mean every day, it's tiring, it's exhausting. It's hard to get people to be involved in that. Um, it's taking a lot of energy and time and commitment on people's part. And also, if you're coming day to day to day, the, the crackdown will be even stronger. You'll bring out the worst. Because once again, remember, they live in t their terror of you. And so they're going to overreact. And that overreaction can be very, very violent. But if you let too much time go by, if like a week goes by or two weeks go by, the energy starts to flag. And what I've noticed is these kind of waves. If every few days or every week you hit them with a new wave, you're out on the streets with a new, 
in, in different cities and different parts or for a different reason or for different groups, but it's continual. So there'll be a lull for a few days where they, everybody kind of takes their breath and you come at them again with even a bigger wave, bigger and bigger and bigger, and you keep the pressure on them continually long enough so that they, you start to create cracks in them. This is what happened recently in Sri Lanka, for example. And so the separation that they're trying to push on you, where they're making you fight amongst yourselves, you are now going to impose on them through your pressure by creating these waves that are bigger and bigger and bigger. You're going to begin to peel off people from the elite classes or others who supported them to not be in their interest anymore. You're going to create separations within the security forces, within the military, within the hierarchies themselves through this continual kind of wave movement. The other thing is these kind, these kind of regimes are incredibly corrupt. They have monopolized the wealth of your country, essentially, and they divvy it up among various different classes who they make kind of complicit in their sort of illegal activity. That will be the upper classes, the wealthy, who are kind of, they're the ones that are able to make all their all the money and they're protected. Then there'll be the military and the security forces. So their weak spot in all of this is actually economic. Because if you can hit them where it hurts, then that gives you a great deal of power. And where that hurts is money itself is in their economic base of power. And the weapon that you have that is the most effective in fighting against this is, is strikes. But not just a strike of, of one little union or one little um, industry here or there, but what is known as a general strike, which can completely paralyze a country. If you can organize every now and then, or just even once, a general strike of every industry all across the country, conceivable lawyers, doctors, um, you know, working class people, uh, blue collar type jobs, everywhere up and down across the country, and bring the country to its heels and paralyze it for just even one day, it's immensely powerful. So it's a very, very powerful message. It shows that their, their idea of dividing classes or ethnicities isn't working, and it hits them where it hurts the most, in their pocketbook. But the one weakness that movements like yours have, and that we've noticed in all of these different countries, and even in the United States to some degree, is this idea of the leaderless movement. So in the past, revolutions or revolutionary movements or rebellions had certain leaders, a group, a cadre of people who were the leaders of the group who would organize things. And that came with its own weaknesses because these cadres of leaders would f form their own kind of party that would then take over and then kind of create another cycle of a totalitarian regime. They spoke in your name. And the strength that you have is you're speaking in your own name. You're not being represented by some leadership group. But what that means is if it's completely amorphous, if it's completely dependent on social media to fuel what you're doing, then when things inevitably kind of peter out, when there are lulls, when a week goes by or two weeks go by, there's nothing there to kind of hold on and say, this is the next step that we can do. This is the vision that we can create in a, another demonstration in a week. This is where how we can up the ante in a few weeks. There's nobody kind of guiding it. One thing that's important is to think of not having a group of leaders because that creates other problems, but to have kind of these committees of people who understand the dangers that the, that the petering out, the lowering of energy will inevitably happen and who kind of plot ways to keep the pot stirred over and over and over again. Okay. So strategy in this moment, in this kind of moment, is your best defense. Just kind of trying to operate strictly on anger and strictly by bitterness and, and all the kind of emotions that are stirred up by this brutal regime. It's not enough. It's very powerful. It can lead to something very exciting for the moment, but it can wear off. And, it can, and in those moments where it wears off, it's extremely dangerous. So strategizing, understanding that you want to keep the pressure on continually, right? You want to keep coming back at them week after week after week after week with something new, upping the ante. 
increasing the width, the numbers of people who are on your side day by day. Um, that is your strength and that is how you're going to make them make mistakes and eventually, hopefully, completely change the nature of your country. Because, to be honest with you, to create a true democracy in Iran, a true republic, one that reflects your own incredibly rich history, would be one of the most beautiful events of the 21st century if it could happen. And um, you can't let this moment pass and you can't let it die down. Because as I said, it is extremely dangerous. Because once that energy starts to flag, they're going to be coming at you like an animal. They're going to be creating that pressure to separate and silence you further and further. And it's going to be even harder to get back up on your feet the next time. You know, these things have to create their own momentum and it must be continual. So your power, your strategy must be, how can we continually keep the pot stirred, not just for weeks, but for months until things start to crack on their side? They're wanting you to crack and you to divide by class, by faction, and you're hoping, you're trying to get them to crack. So keep the whole thing as unified as possible. Have, you know, the fact that it's being led by women and, and fueled by women is the greatest thing in your favor. And understand that so many of us here in the West and in the United States and elsewhere we're following events very closely. I read everything I can about Iran. You have all of my sympathy. I'm 100% for you. And I hope this has some value for you moving forward. Thank you very much.